Thanks for the last tonight. You've been a great crowd. So we're going to be talking about AI today. And so this is actually a Twitch channel called Watch Me Forever that generates endless Seinfeld episodes that are not very funny, but um, could be could be amusing for you. I'll put it up on uh, Discord for you. Is this what computer science teachers watch on their free time? No, no, definitely not. Uh, it's not funny. Like, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about AI today, and uh, we're going to go over your quiz results and stuff to you, but... <clears throat> One thing that AI is really bad at right now is, is humor. It is just not funny at all. Uh, humor involves surprising you with stuff. And uh, AI, uh, the chat GPT stuff, which we'll be talking about, is essentially a very intelligent auto-completion. Like, you know, on your phone, you like type things and like guesses the next words. What it's guessing is the least surprising words, right? The words that it most likely expects to follow. And so um, it's just really bad at humor. Like it makes anti-jokes really well. You know, why Why did the critical thinker cross the road? Let's see, I have some examples on here, I think. Um, <clears throat> Tell me five jokes involving critical thinking. Why did the critical thinker cross the road? to question why the chicken crossed the road and to examine the underlying assumptions and implications of that action. <clears throat> why didn't the skeleton cross the road? It was dead. Yeah, exactly. You can do anti-jokes like that, but um, it's not funny. Although this one is actually kind of funny. What do the critical thinkers say after being asked for their opinion? It depends. True. Uh, how does a critical thinker solve a Rubik's Cube? by examining all the possible combinations, analyzing their properties, and using systematic problem-solving strategies. Yeah, not, like, just not funny. Like, this is not an area where AI is good currently. However, <clears throat> however, this is amazing. So, uh, for those of you that are not aware of ChatGPT, it came out exactly two months ago, and has completely revolutionized, like, how people think of AI. It's thrown the academy, universities into a fur. Um, <clears throat> like people are like, um, like English departments in particular are like up in arms over it because you can ask it to just write things and it will write things. And like write me a thousand word essay and it will just, <clears throat> excuse me. And it will just, you know, give you an essay. And in fact, at the end of last semester, a student asked my permission uh, to write their to write their essay using ChatGPT, and I did. I gave them permission because I was curious to see what happened. And of the three peer reviews that were done, uh, only one of them uh, noticed that it was um, uh, written by AI. The other two were like, "Oh, it's so good, it's very clear." And you know, he had a paragraph saying, "This is the only paragraph written by a human <clears throat> in the three page essay." So clearly, the peer reviewers probably didn't even read the whole thing, but like they had no clue that this was written by AI. And so we're going to do an experiment ourselves. Your next big homework assignment, which is going to be due on Monday, is going to be, uh, you're going to write an essay using ChatGPT, um, and then you're going to have ChatGPT write the same essay. You're going to post both of them, and we're going to see if people can figure out which one is human and which one is AI. We're going to do a Turing test. So that should be um, exciting for you guys. It should be a really fun Assignment, um, it should bring your point totals up and things like that. Uh, but I want to read you this because this is um, this is amazing. So please make a fake presidential speech. <coughs> <coughs> Got to clear my throat because I'm going to read this presidentially. Uh, as if you were the president of Australia. And Australia is currently suffering its darkest hour in the EMU wars. And you need to rally Australians against the EMU horde. Here's the response from the AI. My fellow Australians, today we stand at the brink of our darkest hour. The EMU wars have reached a new level of intensity. And our nation is facing an existential threat from the relentless horde of EMUs. But my friends, I have faith in our collective spirit and strength. We faced challenges before and emerged stronger. And we will do so again. I call upon every Australian, from the cities to the countryside, 
to join together in this struggle. We must put aside our differences and come together as one people, united against the common enemy, the EMU. Our military is working tirelessly to defend our borders and protect our people. We are deploying the latest technology and tactics to repel the EMU and restore order. But this war will not be won on the battlefield alone. We must also stand firm in our resolve and determination. We must be vigilant in our communities and report any suspicious EMU activity. We must conserve resources and support those on the front line. Together, we can overcome this challenge. We are a resilient and resourceful people, and we will emerge from this conflict with our heads held high. So let us stand united, my fellow Australians. Let us rally behind our flag and defend our nation from the emu horde. Together, we will emerge victorious and stronger than ever before. We will not go quietly into the night. We will not go out without a fight. For today, my fellow Australians, today is our Independence Day. Thank you. So, uh, it's not a fake war. What do you mean it's a fake war? It's not a fake war. <clears throat> the emu war was a traumatic event in Australian history. You can see hand-to-hand -hand combat. Like it, it was a it was a brutal, hard-fought struggle between the emus and the and the Australians, and the uh, the Australians lost. Uh, that's the that's why it had to carry such deep, traumatic memories for the Australian people. Uh, this is the devastation wrought by the uh, by the emu hordes. You can see uh, there were no survivors on the uh, Australian side. Uh, some of the uh, some of the veterans were haunted for life. Like, look at that guy's haunted for life by the uh, the scenes that he saw during the Emu War. So, uh, very real, very dumb. I love it. It's absolutely a real war. Absolutely, uh, the Emu War, known as the Great Emu War, uh, was taken in 1932. <clears throat> While none of the birds were killed, were killed, the Emus won and continue to cause crop destruction. So, um, the uh, Chinese actually did something similar. Uh, let's see if they have a four pest campaign. So the uh, in China, Mao um, <clears throat> decided that sparrows were eating their grain. And so they would go um, and scare sparrows by banging pots and pans together and the birds would fly to another tree. And they'd bang it again and they would keep disturbing the sparrows until they died of a heart attack essentially which is quite horrible they would chop down trees kill the eggs and nests and things like that and so um, you can see here mosquitoes flies sparrows and rats were the four pests and as a result of this <clears throat> uh the sparrows won uh 50 million like i'm actually not joking here uh 50 million chinese people died i'm actually not joking um, so the, uh, the, uh, killing of the sparrows led to a, uh, uh, ballooning of the locust population, which caused a great famine. And, uh, they eventually had to import 250,000 sparrows to replenish the population, uh, because, uh, it caused a widespread famine in China as a result of, um, killing the sparrows. And so the lesson here, my fellow Australians, is not to go to war with birds. Uh, they have won every time. They have a perfect track record against um, humans. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, like they were machine gunning emus and everything. Yeah, it's a true story. And then I asked ChatGPT to uh, write it in the cell of Trump based on a student's suggestion in the previous class. My fellow Australians, we have a big, big problem. I mean... A huge problem. The Emu Wars. It's a disaster, folks. Never seen anything like it. Believe me. But we're going to fix it. We're going to make Australia great again. Believe me. We're going to take care of the Emus. We're going to take care of it. Big league. Yeah. So it's pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Pretty amazing stuff. Yeah. So let's uh, let's go over the quiz before we get into AI too much. Um, what a camped out waiting for the Emus. No way I'm going down to a bird. Yeah, they were driving around in trucks like machine gunning them and stuff. Um, uh, the Emu War is real. Like, the Emu War is real. The Four Pass campaign was real, you know. Um, I don't tell you. Sound, it sounds like it's fake, but it's, it's real. Uh, let's see. Where we, okay. 
So on the quiz, uh, you guys did pretty well overall. I've had some messages from people like worried about their grades. That's one of the reasons why I'm giving you a very easy assignment worth a lot of points um, with the chat GPT thing, which again, I'll get into later. Um, it's designed to just raise your grades up. The only way you are going to not get 100% on the AI assignment is if you wait to the last minute. And I understand you want to wait to the last minute, but ChatGPT has been very busy. And so like one of my friends, she says she's been almost unable to use it ever because it's always full. So if you wait to like the last minute and it's full, then you're going to get locked out. You're going to get a zero. You're going to be sad. Your grade's going to go down. I can't help you. Okay. Like the, the, this is literally a softball. I'm, I'm underhand pitching you guys a 20 point critical thinking assignment. All you have to do is just have the AI write an essay for you. And then you write a little essay and that's it. You're going to get hundred percent. It'll be great. Just don't wait to the last minute. Okay. You guys cool. You guys understand? <clears throat> just don't wait to the last minute. And I know it's hard. I know it's hard. Just trust me on this. The thing's been busy. Okay. So is it posted on Canvas? It's not yet. It will be soon. Okay. So let's go over the quiz. Uh, we went over three theories of truth last time. Let's see how you guys did. Correspondence theory says, it is true that I have a remote control in my hand because, look, I actually have a remote control in my hand. It's the most commonsensical theory of truth out there. It's what's used in science. Ricola contains menthol is true because Ricola actually does contain menthol. I'm still recovering from my cold. <clears throat> and so I've got my cough drops here. And yeah, there it is, menthol. Okay, correspondence theory. Uh, pragmatic theory was the second one. Uh, this is literally the example I used in class of free will, right? So we can see which percentage of people um, we're guessing, I guess. I don't know. Um, these quizzes, I, I don't think they have a time limit on them, do they? Like, I don't think they have a time limit. I mean, people spend like an hour on it, which is kind of wild, but um, like you just watch the, the lecture, get it right. I don't know. I mean, I don't. I don't think that guessing is like a particularly um, great strategy on quizzes if you care about your grades. But okay, Biden is president is true. Now, this one uh, got a lot of you guys because the example I gave in class was. Biden is president is true because it corresponds to reality. But this one is not correspondence theory. This one is coherence theory. Coherence theory says a fact is true if it matches all the other facts that we know to be true. So Biden is president is true because it matches all of the things I know that are true. And so that is coherence theory. And uh, uh, like the um, uh, chat GPT said, um, I actually had ChatGPT summarize the five major theories of truth. You can do that. You can use it. It's actually a great study tool. Yep. So uh, you're like, hey, tell me about the five theories of truth. So And explain it to me like I'm a sixth grader, right? And you can actually adjust the writing level of it, which is pretty amazing. So correspondence theory says that this theory says truth is when we believe or say it matches up with things actually are in the real world. It's like when you say the sky is blue and you look outside and the sky is blue. Look, there it is. Correspondence theory. Coherence theory. <clears throat> this uh, theory, um, you hope chat GPT stays forever. Uh, we'll, we'll see if it's free forever. Um, it's probably going to stay around forever, but whether or not it's free forever is a good question. So Karen's theory says this truth, the truth is when our beliefs and ideas fit together in a logical and consistent way. It's like when you have a bunch of puzzle pieces and they all fit together perfectly. Great way of explaining. Thank you, chat GPT. <clears throat> pragmatic theory. This theory says that truth is what works best in practice. If something helps us get what we want or solve problems, it's considered true. It's like if you try different ways to build a tower with blocks, you keep the way that works best. And I like that it thinks that um, sixth graders are playing with blocks still, but you know, whatever. So anyway, um, you can actually use ChatGPT for um, summarizing things. Like you can actually have it like explain concepts to you, which is pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> But the, the big issue, the big issue in it is, is plagiarism. We'll, we'll get to it as soon as I finish this. So a priori versus a posteriori, pretty bad, honestly, for what amounts to true and false. Um, there was a third option available for people that took it early. 
I deleted the third option and gave everybody points on that because I don't know why there was a blank one, but there was. Uh, Canvas does that sometimes. Can something detect this? Yes, there is. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. There's this thing. So a priori means knowing something without making an observation. So, uh, for example, uh, things in math, you can just sit on your couch and prove that the square root of, the square root of two is rational. Uh, a posteriori, a priori means beforehand. A posteriori means afterwards. A priori means before an observation. A, pri a posteriori means after an observation. So <clears throat> you can determine there are no married bachelors in New York beforehand by just thinking about it logically. Like, okay, that's a contradiction. Contradictions can't exist. Therefore, there are no married bachelors in New York. That would be an a priori way of doing it. However, this way is a posteriori because we're knowing it by going there and asking people, hey, are you a married bachelor? No. Are you a married bachelor? No. Are you a married bachelor? Yes. Okay. Are you a married bachelor? No. Are you a married bachelor? Yes. Okay, well, it looks like 93% of uh, New York are not married bachelors. So uh, the a posteriori route is not uh, as reliable as the a priori route. But a lot of times, the only time you can know something is through observation, right? Like, could you tell that Ricola has menthol in it just by knowing the term Ricola? Probably not. Uh, you need to do an observation. You need to actually look at the ingredients on the back. You need to know it through a posteriori means. Okay. So uh, what we're going to go over today is uh, a couple more theories of truth, and then we'll jump back into the AI stuff. So um, <clears throat> so we went over these three, correspondence, coherence, and pragmatic last time. Today we're going to go over the next three. You might be like, but wait, that adds up to six. I thought there were five theories of truth. Um, yeah, <clears throat> the sixth one here is not found in philosophy textbooks, but I think it's quite compelling. So we're going to go into that as well. Okay, so uh, consensus theory of truth says that which is true is that which everybody agrees to, right? So if everybody agrees that 2 plus 2 equals 4, then 2 plus 2 equals 4. If everybody agrees 2 plus 2 equals 3, then it's true that 2 plus 2 equals 3. What do you guys think about that? <clears throat> do you think this benefits education or do you think it'll make us lazy and less creative? I don't know. It's only been out for two, two months and most people don't know about it yet, so we will have to wait and see. Um, yeah. is not the best way to conduct your thinking? Well, it's a theory of truth, right? So does everybody agreeing on something make it true? English teachers are petrified because kids doing their work, they use this. Yeah. But let me let me give you a counter argument to that. And I've had a discussion with the dean about this already. I'm meeting, I'm on the tech committee and uh, we've, we're gonna, we've talked about it and we will talk about it. Um, I'm gonna be talking at, our department meeting and things like that about this. Let, let me give you guys something to think about while you're answering this question on consensus theory. If you um, submit an essay on Canvas and it was written using ChatGPT, maybe it doesn't get detected today. But what about next month? What about next semester? Right, Turnitin.com right now doesn't have the ability to detect AI essays. Because what Turnitin.com to text is an essay that's a copy of another person's essay. But they're working on it, right? And there are tools that can detect it. And so maybe next month, next semester, next year, they do a scan of everybody's essays submitted last year and it flags you. Is it worth the risk of getting hauled up in front of academic, uh, you know, dishonesty committees, maybe getting booted out of college in order to write your essay for you? What do you think? <clears throat> abuse it while you can. No, because any essay you submit now is permanently stored on Canvas. It doesn't, like, if you make it to the end of the semester and get your A, that is not any, like, it's not like, and it's over. No. Like, I detected a student cheating a year ago in spring. 
And so I submit the documentation and I can retroactively change his grade to drop it from an A to a B. Like, and then all of that goes onto your record. You get hauled in front of the dean. It's an enormously stressful and painful process for me too. Like I hate dealing with cheating incidents. It's not fun for me, right? Uh, what if it flags you on accident? Great question. And so like chat GPT, maybe watermarking things and putting secret Unicode characters that don't print into its text and you don't know about it, but you copy and paste it in, clear giveaway that you plagiarized the text. Okay. So anyway, all right. So let's, we'll, we'll come back to that now that we got some answers here. Consistence theory. If no one can say something's false, doesn't mean that it could be untrue. Sometimes what everybody thinks to be true may be false. Yeah, and that's that's really a problem like in science, right? Science is very much against consensus theory of truth, right? Um, everybody knows that, you know, Newtonian physics is right, you know, and then Einstein comes along and it's wrong, right? The, the, you know, we all think that phlogiston creates fire. Phlogiston was this mysterious substance that was the essence of fire, right, or whatever. Um, nope. <clears throat> no such thing as phlogiston. Um, no such thing as the four humors in the body. There's no, yeah, I mean, there is bile, but like it doesn't, you know, do, it doesn't cause you to become bilious, right? And there's no color and phlegm. I mean, you have phlegm, but like being phlegmatic, which means slow and lazy, isn't caused by an excess of phlegm, you know, coming out of your nose, right? Um, <clears throat> so in science, it's very opposed to consensus theory because the notion that there is truth out there and it's up to us to discover it. And people can be wrong, right? Like we're all wrong about the four humors in medicine. And we go out there and we do experimentation. We write down our results. We analyze the results. And we're like, nope, that's wrong. We have discovered the truth. The truth is this. So science is adamantly opposed to consensus theory. That said, um, as much as scientists like to say, oh, I love it when I get proven wrong. Scientists have egos too, and they will vociferously defend defend their you know their opinions on things, even if they're wrong. They don't like being proven wrong. They say they do. Now, uh, where would um, where would this actually be useful? Well, let's talk about um, like okay, so like we we used Joe Biden last time, right? Joe Biden. It is true that Joe Biden is president because in reality he is president. Let's talk about consensus theory. Joe Biden is president because everybody agrees that he's president. What if everybody thought he wasn't president? Like everybody, like the Secret Service, the, the people running security at the White House. Joe Biden goes up to the front of the White House. He's like, no, 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 you can't come in. You're not president. The White, the, the White House press corps doesn't pay any attention to him. The media doesn't pay any attention to him. Is Joe Biden actually president? Like, he might have won the election, right? But if literally nobody, like, treats him like he's president, he's effectively not president, right? Like, nobody listens to his opinion on the Ukraine crisis. Nobody, you know, gives him a presser. Uh, no Secret Service follows him around. He doesn't get a ride on the, the cool helicopters and things like that, right? <clears throat> so, you know, to a certain extent, like, yeah, like political positions and things like that are social constructs, right? Like uh, supreme executive power derives from a mandate from the masses, not from some farcical aquatic ceremony, right? So, uh, yeah, and they can revoke your grades afterwards. Yep, 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 absolutely. Uh, paraphrase, paraphrase AI, and then paraphrase it again. I would not ever copy, copy and paste anything from, um, never copy and paste anything. I would not trust it at all. <clears throat> group think stops progression and critical thinking. Um, I think something could be true. If everyone agrees, you've proven it or can be proven. Um, it used to be accepted that the earth was flat, but then uh, they sailed around it. As it turned out, um, no, people didn't really think the earth was flat. Like, if you're on a mountain, you can see ships, like, vanishing over the, over the horizon. Like, it's mostly an urban legend that people thought the earth was flat. Um... <clears throat> Does 1984 use consensus theory? Yeah, I would say so. Um, 
So, um, you know, we, we have always been at war with uh, Eurasia, right? Uh, we've always been at war with, you know. Uh, so 1984 is definitely a consensus theory of truth. Um, you are familiar with that book. So um, an, another place where consensus theory comes up a lot is in definitions, right? Think about it. <clears throat> like definition, the truth of a definition, the, I don't know if it's truth is the right word, but, um, <clears throat> like definitions are created by people agreeing that a word means something, right? Like this is a remote control. If I told you this is a polar bear, you'd be like, no, it's not. It's, it's a remote control. But what if like when you're growing up, everybody's like, yeah, that's a, that's a, this is a polar bear. And everybody just called it a polar bear. You're like, mommy, mommy, why is this a polar bear? And you're like, oh, it's white. You know, and make, this is an air conditioning remote control. It can be cold. Like in the Arctic, it's a polar bear. And, and then everybody, like you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even think about it. You're like, oh, that's, hand me the polar bear. I need to turn the AC on. Right. <clears throat> Uh, it's not a TV one. This is a, this is a remote control, um, for the uh, KC here. So, um, isn't everything under this theory? Um, yeah, I mean, this is green right here, right? So a lot of, you know, like when, when it comes to like definitions and things like that, like consensus theory, it's like, yeah, we agree that a word means something, right? And it's also used a lot in morality. So everybody agrees that murder is bad. And so we pass laws saying that murder is bad, right? We used to agree that uh, slavery was acceptable, you know? And then we uh, had a little conflict called the Civil War. And now uh, we agree that slavery is, uh, is wrong, right? <clears throat> Consensus theory, that which is true is that which we agree to. And so, you know, beforehand, slavery was legal in America because... You know, this, I don't, I, I, it's more like state level rather than population level, but at a state level, yeah, there was this general agreement that it was okay, at least at the beginning. And then after the civil war, general agreement, it, it was wrong and it became illegal, mostly, except as punishment for a crime. Uh, can you believe America is called the flinky dinky will donker light switch? That's funny. <clears throat> a helicopter is a uh, whirly, whirly bird something, right? Um, okay. Uh, is it laggy for you guys? Let's see here. I can reduce the stream quality if you want. Uh, 1080p. There you go. The truth can be changed under consensus theory. It certainly can, right? Like, you know, uh, and, or, and people can have different sort of societal views on truth, like in Nazi Germany, like they had a lot of views that like we disagreed with at a fundamental level. And that led to the conflict known as World War II, right? So um, Nazis were inherently based on this sort of... Um, ethnic supremacy view of like the Germanic people are superior to like, you know, the Jews and the Slavs and the Roma and things like that. And we're involved in like geographic acquisition of new lands for Germanic peoples. Like that was the fundamental, you know, truth of Nazism. And we were like, no, that's not cool. Right. And uh, the Slavs, you know, like the Russia was like, no, that's not cool. And so there was, you know, this, conflict called World War II, which was essentially founded over, um, you know, very fundamental differences in values of, of different civilizations, right? <clears throat> the Mandela effect, yeah, that's a, that's a good example, too, where everyone believes something to be true. But, I mean, the Mandela effect kind of acknowledges there is actual reality, right? Like, everybody believed Mandela was dead, um, but he wasn't actually dead, right? So the Mandela effect, I would say, is a counter-argument to, to consensus theory, where Everybody believes something to be true, but in reality, it was not true, right? So that, that would be more correspondence theory. Okay. Uh, looks like we found the favorite. Who's the favorite? I gave, I gave him a thumbs up on the Fleeky Donker 
flinky, flicky, dinky will donker because it was funny. If you make me laugh or say something clever, I will give you an update sometimes. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, do people with higher power have a big role in influence? Sure. Yeah, definitely. There's definitely something to do with political power and things like that. Like the people who write the dictionaries, right? They get a sort of control consensus. And and like if you change the dictionary so that like um, this is a flicky dicky waldonger or something like that, then people might start calling it that, right? So there is some inherent uh, um, connection to power and things like that also. And, and then you get, go down to the whole rabbit hole of like, you know, construction of power and all this kind of postmodern nonsense. Um, I'm not really interested in going down right now. Uh, but that's that's one of the theories of truth. And, and the areas where I think it's most commonly used, like I said, is definitions, politics, and uh, morality, ethics. Okay. <clears throat> um, Nazis are inherently based. What is that? For legal reasons is a joke. Um, Lamau. Just like the book Frindle, soon calls a pen then everyone starts using it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like if everyone starts calling a pen a Frindle, like this is this is a Frindle now, right? Hand soup. It's a Zoomer joke. I got you. Okay. Sorry, I, I don't use the term based because um, the whole like based and red pilled thing, like, um, yeah, I'm, yeah, it, it must be one of those uh, uh, Zoomer jokes that I'm too old to understand. I don't know. The most energetic Lamau I've ever heard. <laughs> I'm trying not to laugh too hard because <coughs> I'm still recovering from a cold. <coughs> You're killing me. Okay. Uh, would you take the red or the blue pill? I would take both. That's the only. That's the only solution. Okay. So. <coughs> uh, so the deflationary theory of the, of truth is even uh, sort of more cynical than the consensus theory. So the deflationary theory of truth says that there is like what we consider philosophical truth, that there's something sort of um, true and perfect and right and, you know, accurate, you know, however you want to describe truth. No, none of that. There is none of this sort of philosophical, beautiful notion of underlying universal eternal truth. Now, Deflationary theory says uh, when you say something is true, um, you're not saying anything at all meaningful. You're not saying anything meaningful at all. Um, essentially, you're just agreeing with somebody. So if somebody says, uh, <clears throat> I play uh, bass, you might think oh, he's uh, mispronouncing that. No, I play bass. Okay. Um, if somebody says, you know, bass is the best instrument, uh, and somebody says, yeah, that's true. Uh, they didn't say anything meaningful. All they're saying is they agree with the person, right? Uh, bass is the best instrument. That's true. The Padres are the best baseball team. That's true. Like you're not, you're not saying there's some underlying universal eternal truth about the Padres. You're just agreeing with somebody. You're not saying anything really meaningful. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, and so, like under deflationary theory, saying 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true is just the same thing as saying 2 plus 2 equals 4. Like it doesn't, it doesn't really contribute very much. And, and like, there is, it's, it's a subjective theory of truth. Like, different people could say different things are true, and that's fine because you just, they're just agreeing to different things, right? Michael Jordan was a good baseball player. That's true. Was he a good baseball player? I think he, I think Michael Jordan did play baseball, right? I don't know if he was good. I mean, probably better than me. Right? Am I misremembering this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I thought so. All right. Um, he was a great basketball player, but he played baseball too. So, um, yeah, I, 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 that was a long time ago, but, um, yeah, like some people might think he was a great baseball player. Some people might say, ah, eh, he wasn't that good in the, major leagues and it'll be, you know, and different people can have different truths for that. Like I, you know, most people would say he was a great basketball player, but a great baseball player. Yeah. It's true. It's false. I don't know. But it doesn't really matter. Under deflationary theory, there is really no truth. Um, okay. Um, 
You didn't verify the source. I saw a baseball card, man. Like, that's good enough for me. Okay. Um, so, uh, Marxist theory is not one of the classical five theories of truth. But um, I discovered this when I read a um, short story, not really a short story, essay by a sci-fi author named Robert Heinlein. Heinlein. And... Um, he was uh, one of the top sci-fi authors of the 60s and 70s and 50, 50s, late 40s as well, I think. Rocket ship calendars. Forty-seven, yeah. So from about the 40s to about the 70s, he was like, you could arguably say he's the top sci-fi author in America. <clears throat> and he went to Russia as a tourist. So the Soviet Union had a, a tourist agency called Interest, and you would pay the money, and they would take you on a guided tour of the Soviet Union. They obviously did not allow Westerners to just travel freely inside of the Soviet Union, but they would station a spy, essentially, to watch you the whole time as you go around and take pictures and stuff like that. So he was in the Soviet Union during the U-2 crisis. So for those of you, uh, have you guys heard of the U-2 crisis? <clears throat> it was like when uh, Bono... Before it was a band, there we go. Uh, before it was a band, it was a spy plane. So, um, in 1960, a spy plane was shot down over America. And Heinlein was actually in the country at the time. And he got arrested and interrogated because they thought he had something to do with it. Because he was, like, the only Westerner within, like, 100 miles of, like, where the spy plane was. And they're like, he's clearly communicating with the spy plane. And, um, and so he was, like, interrogated by the KGB. And he... Um, wrote a, you know, an essay about this, this experience and, uh, a couple actually. And the, um, I don't even know what's happening on chat right now. Why, why are you guys, what is, what is, what is happening here? What they do with tourists in North Korea. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. So, uh, so he wrote, a. uh, an essay called On Interest, uh, On His Experiences. He also wrote another essay called uh, Pravda Means Truth. And so <clears throat> Pravda was the name of the mouthpiece of the Soviet Union. It was a newspaper published uh, by the official, it was essentially the official newspaper in the Soviet Union. And uh, Pravda literally means truth. It's the word meaning truth. But what Heinlein found was that what they consider truth was not what we would consider truth. And that's why I'm including it here on the theories of truth. Um, the, the Russians divided, the Soviets, I should say, because the Soviet Union was more than just Russia. Uh, the Soviets divided truth into greater truth, Pravda, and then little truth. So there was greater truth, which was Pravda, and little truth, which was those mundane, uh, factual details. Right. So, for example, greater truth was the revolution is succeeding. Little truth is like agricultural production is down 25 percent and a million people just starve to death. And so anytime greater truth and little truth conflicted, greater truth had to win. This was greater. And so back in the 1800s, a guy by the name of Karl Marx um, wrote uh, some some stuff and basically developed a scientific theory, although he didn't do any actual science, as far as I can tell. He developed a scientific theory, uh, basically stating that human civilization follows, inevitably follows a certain pathway from like, you know, people living in, you know, tribes to like feudalism, to capitalism, to socialism, to communism. And it's inevitable. The, the revolution is inevitable. And, uh, you know, all of human history will inevitably end up there. And so if you have, uh, and, and so if you buy into that notion that it's inevitable that communism will win, then small trivial details like the Holodomor and things like that uh, are just, uh, you know, details to be sort of brushed under the rug because they're wrong. Even though they're true, they're wrong because they disagree with the greater truth, the Pravda. So uh, have any of you guys seen the uh, TV show, um, How Did They Starve if, if They Had Each Other? Um, have any of you guys seen the TV show Chernobyl? So, you know, Chernobyl was a nuclear reactor in Ukraine. It's part of the Soviet Union. 
and it melted down and blew its lid and sprayed radioactive material over half of Europe. Anyone see the show? Chernobyl. It's on HBO, I think. Negative. Nope. I have not. Nope. Nah. Nope. Nope. Me neither. So I can't tell you about it. Okay. So anyway, so what relevance does this have to uh, what relevance does this have to uh, uh, the theories of truth? Well, it's a theory of truth for one thing. But after I read that essay, I started seeing it used all over the place in America. Because uh, if you want to summarize the Marxist theory of truth, it's that which is true is that which helps the revolution. That which is false is that which hinders the revolution. But replace revolution with my political party. And then you will see this theory of truth be used everywhere. Um, I have never seen Tucker Carlson, for example, ever say, you know what? Joe Biden did a great job today. I think he is a competent president who, uh, you know, you know, despite, you know, having some age issues, you know, and I've, I've taken him to task for this and that in the past. You know, I think he did a great job signing that bill. Never seen that happen. And I doubt it will ever happen in the entire tenure of Joe Biden's presidential career. Contrawise, if you look at CNN, I used to play something called the CNN game. Uh, on my way to college, I listened to five news stations every day. I listened to Fox. I listened to CNN. I listened to a, a middle wing uh, station and then two other ones as well. So I get my news intake from five different political beliefs uh, deliberately. And every time I listened to CNN, I would play what I call the CNN game. And I would turn it on and I would start counting in my head. Now, this doesn't work if it's like on an advertisement or they're doing like a CNN movie or something. But like just their normal like news broadcast. I sit there. I'm like, all right, go. One, 1,000. Two, 1,000. And I would see how long it would take them to mention Trump. The average amount of time was four seconds. Only twice in four years of Trump's presidency did it make it past 15 seconds. CNN talked about Trump the entire Trump presidency. There were no other news stories as far as I can tell. Right? It was like the, the disappearance of that Malaysian Airlines flight or whatever. Like They just talked about it for nonstop for a year. Um, all they talked about during Trump's presidency was Trump. And all of the stories were negative except one. Only once did I ever see them uh, say anything positive about Trump. And that was when he uh, bombed Syria about a year into his presidency. And uh, uh, every other story they were on him was negative. And even after he got out of office, they still talked about him. Like, you can still play this game today. The percentage is lower now. It's like maybe 80% of the time. But like, yeah, turn it on and they're going to be talking about the Trump papers seized at Mar-a-Lago. They're going to be talking about January 6th. Like, just play that game. Just turn it on. Like I said, it's lower now because it's been three years since he's been out of office. So you don't really have as much material to go on as, like, when he would do horrible things like having a second scoop of ice cream over dinner, which was the story that CNN ran. Um, but, yeah, like, CNN, like, is basically constitutionally unable to say anything positive about him. And Fox is just unable to say anything positive about Biden. Or imagine Trump. Imagine Trump saying, hey, you know, Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, great person, great to work with. No. Anytime it comes to the Republicans and the Democrats, that which is true is that which helps their political party. So the only say, Republicans only say good things about Republicans and only say bad things about Democrats. And the facts they pick are always facts that make Republicans look bad and, and Republicans look good and Democrats look bad. When Trump was in office, the economy is doing great. When Biden's in office, the economy is doing terrible. Democrats, when Biden's in office, the economy is doing great. When Republicans are in office, the economy is doing terrible. And and once you understand that, then like understanding everything that politicians say, use this theory of truth with very few exceptions. Uh, everything on Fox and CNN and everything a Republican says, like when you understand the theory of truth you're using, they're using, then you can understand like what's going on, right? And I feel it makes you much more canny observer of... Um, of politics and news and media and things like that. So, um, CNN trying not to mention Trump. <laughs> That's funny. 
Okay. Um, okay. So let's uh, let's get back to Chat GPT. So uh, there is a um, there is a Chat GPT um, plagiarism detector. So you can take any of these essays written by Chat GPT and paste it, hit submit, <clears throat> and it will give you a likelihood that it was written by an AI. And so, like I said earlier, ChatGPT is essentially a smart auto-completion system. And so it is, um, it is usually going to give you the most likely words that follow another word. And so if you uh, analyze the surprisingness of an essay, AI-generated code is not very surprising. And so what happens is they basically run their own tool on it and say, hey, are these words in the essay the words that we would have picked to follow these words? And if they were, then it's likely AI-generated. So it's sort of measuring the surprisingness of an essay. Humans will surprise you with how surprising they are. Uh, AI will always go with the uh, most expected route, at least the way that they're currently designed. And that's why the humor is so flat. Because humor has to be surprising to be funny most of the time, right? Although sometimes, like, you know, just pointing out a truth can be funny sometimes, right? Does it detect vocab choice? No, it detects surprisingness. Is the word they picked here the word that I would have, like, the most likely word? And if it was, then it's probably AI generated. It needs at least a thousand words to detect. And it gives you confidence. Likely, possibly, not, very likely not. So um, what you're going to do for your assignment is you're going you're going to write an essay on anything you want, like any topic. It's funny. Write a grim dark fantasy novel. I'm sorry, I cannot do that, Dave. So there's there's all of these like blocks that the OpenAI people have put in there. Like give me a George R. R. Martin novel. No. Okay, fine. Um, you know, give me uh, give me a thousand word essay on why people should not go to college. I'm sorry, I cannot do that, Dave. Right. And so like it won't write an essay on why you shouldn't go to college. But if you ask it to like um, <clears throat> give you pros and cons of going to college, then it will do that. Right. So there's all these like AI blocks in there to stop it from being like used harmfully. Although I think the word harm is like grossly misused these days. Like giving people re like writing an essay on like why people shouldn't go to college is not harmful. Right. Like it, like, it, it just bugs me, like, how people just use the harm. Like, it's you're harming me by giving me, like, a, 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 a well-written essay on why I shouldn't go to college. No. No, like, not everybody should go to college, right? Like, if you want to be a plumber, you're probably better off not going to college. I'm a, I love college, by the way, and I think that everybody would benefit from it. You know, but, like, college is crazy expensive, and you have to weigh, you know, the cost of, like, your personal growth with, you know, being six digits in debt right? When it's not benefiting you as a plumber, right? So, um, so let's give me, give me a topic. We'll, we'll have it, we'll have it write a, uh, we'll have it write an essay real fast. $5 a gallon. Yeah. It's not allowed to write hurtful things. Yeah. Like it's, it's called safetyism and it's like one of the worst parts of our society right now. Like when we talk about safety and harm and trauma, like this used to be like, you know, PTSD, right? Like you went to the war and you saw your buddy's head blown off. And you suffered trauma from it. Now it's like, um, you know, like the, the words have been so diluted that it's, um, it's kind of ridiculous. Can it write about itself? Uh, yeah. In fact, the student last semester who wrote the essay, wrote the essay on using chat GPT to write essays. And then I graded his essay using chat GPT, which is kind of funny. Um, would it repeat the same essay? It tends to. Yeah, it tends to give you the very similar kinds of stuff. Could be literally about anything. I mean, I don't want to say anything because then people are going to talk about, like, I don't know, like the value of murdering people or something. You know, like, be reasonable. Reasonably, it could be anything. How about that? Was that was that going to be your, your essay topic? The, the beauty of murder or something? Um, so give me, give me a topic. Well, let's, let's have it make something. We're out of time. Um, okay, fine. Uh, write a, an essay on the times when CNN 
had something positive to say about President Trump. How about that? An error occurred. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, that is perfect. That is absolutely perfect. It caused it caused the AI to self-destruct. Okay, well, let me give you an example of what I, what I did last <clears throat> last class. Um, I said, write a uh, tell me a story about a dog and a cat that were once enemies, now friends, and go on an epic quest across the country to find a magic bone. Write it in the style of a third grade book. Once upon a time, there's a dog named Max and a cat named Minnins. Max and Minnins lived in the same neighborhood, but they didn't get along. And so what this is doing, it's essentially auto-completing, right? It's creating the most likely um, sentences based on the prompt. <clears throat> ChatGPT adds like chatbot functionality on top of that. <clears throat> uh, write an essay on Andrew Tate. <laughs> it's just within reason, please. Just within reason, you know, just be somewhat reasonable. Like I'm, I'm a fairly tolerant person. But yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Max thought Minnens was too snobbish, and Minnens thought Max was too noisy. They're always fighting and bickering with each other. Da, 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 da. Made wishes when they found the magic bone. Turned their dreams into reality. Max wished for a big cozy doghouse, and Minnens wished for a big basket of cat toys. They were overjoyed. They hugged each other, realizing the best wish of all was the friendship they had found along the way. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> And then I had it rewrite it as a graduate level. And then you can see it actually changes the writing level of the, of the essay. Once upon a time, there were two unlikely companions, a dog and a cat. Despite their initial animosity towards each other, they eventually formed an unbreakable bond through their shared experiences and adversity. Together, they set out on a journey across the rugged terrain of the land in search of a legendary artifact, the magic bell. So... What's interesting to me is that they actually chose not to use the bone um, at the end. When it, at, so for kids, they use the magic bone to wish for a doghouse and cat toys. Uh, at the graduate level, they choose the magic bone was not the be-all and end-all, but rather the bonds of friendship and the journey itself are what truly mattered. And so to, the dog and the cat returned home, content in the knowledge their friendship had become stronger and the spirits remained. So um, pretty cool stuff. All right. And so what you're going to do is once the discussion is up, you're going to write a one page essay on any topic you want within reason. Uh, and you're going to have the AI write it. You're going to post it on there on Monday. Um, it's going to issue you guys um, peer reviews. You're going to get three students and you're going to guess. This one is the human one. This one is the AI one. And we're going to see, we're going to do an experiment. We're going to find out if you guys are going to be able to, Figure out which one was written by humans, which one was written by AI. And then uh, after the peer reviews are in, you're going to tell the people, yes, that's correct, or no, that's wrong. Okay? Easy 20 points. It'll boost all of your grades. Again, the only way you can fail this is if you don't do it. Right? Or if you wait to the last minute and ChatGPT gets full. ChatGPT gets filled up. You're going to be like, Professor, I'm trying to use ChatGPT. And I'm like, I told you. Don't wait to the last minute. Make sure you get the ChatGPT essay in now or something. Okay. <clears throat> Graduate level also doesn't name the cat Middens and Max. Yeah, that's true also. They're just a uh, dog and cat, right? So we get to write our own and use GPT. So you're going to turn in two essays. Yes. And the directions will be up here on the discussion forum uh, momentarily. Okay. So you have to write an essay too. Yes. You write an essay. ChatGPT writes an essay. You don't say which one's which, right? First one or second one, you know, whichever one, whichever way you want to do it. And then people are going to guess. Essay one, essay two, human, AI. Okay. So uh, you can write a story like that. Yeah, I, I literally don't care, like, about the essay itself, right? The, the goal here is to see if we can distinguish between humans and AI. And... <clears throat> Like I said, if you it, like, I, I don't think any students should be using ChatGPT to actually submit essays because as AI detection progresses, it will catch you and you will get possibly booted out of school. I don't know. But I do think ChatGPT is useful for like proofreading. Like you can say, hey, proofread my essay for me 
And as long as you don't copy and paste anything, but you're like, oh, look, yeah, that's a spelling mistake. That's a grammatical mistake. I think that's fine. And I also think it's really useful for like summarizing things. Like you can, you can ask ChatGPT, hey, summarize this topic in computer science. And it actually does a fantastic job explaining things to you. Like I asked it to explain to me the difference between quicksort and stable sort in the C++ standard library. And it's like, here's how you call this one. Here's how you call this one. This is when you use this one. This is when you use this one. This is the pros. This is the cons. And I was like, pretty good. You know, like it probably explained it better than I could have to people. You know, I was like, nice. Yeah, it's, it's <clears throat> honestly, I think, I think it's best use right now is for you guys in help study. Like if you don't understand a concept in your organic, organic chemistry class, or in your discrete math class or something like that, you just ask it like, hey, what's the difference between breadth first search and depth first search? I've asked it before. It does a fantastic job explaining it. And you can say, go on, and it'll give you more information on it. And you can say, hey, explain this to me as if I was a third grader, and it will lower the language. It's pretty cool. So I, I don't think you guys should use ChatGPT for plagiarism. I don't, I'm honestly not worried about it being used in plagiarism just because the people who plagiarize are going to get caught and booted. Um, I think it's better as just a study aid and a way of you acquiring information. Like it's like having your own personal professor, right? Whenever you want, just, Hey, explain this to me. I've also used it to like generate like uh, homework assignments. Well, one so far, I'm going to see if I'm going to see if students can notice when I give them an AI generated homework assignment. And I've had it generate like stories, like big, like I, I had it generate like a 30 page story involving my friends in Skyrim. So the two essays should be on the same topic. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> you guys cool. Yeah. So I said here, here are five friends. This one's an Argonian wizard. This one's, a, you know, and then it generated it. Like I just said, go on. And then this happens. And then by prompting it, it would just generate new chapters of the story. And I posted it on my private group chat with some of my friends. And it was like a 30 page story it held together pretty well. So, okay, okay. So that is it for today. Thanks everyone. Look, be on the lookout for that. And I'll give you a quiz also on the new theories of truth. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.